Having one murder in the rectory is bad luck, but having a second one seems careless or even worse. So my attempts to explain that the maid found dead in the kitchen was no longer a servant were pointless. The unfortunate reality that she had once worked for us was enough to stir up the gossip in the town of Ashbury, quicker than a group of hunting dogs catching the scent of prey. To make matters worse, my wife had openly expressed our joy when Sarah left our employment. Clara, my dear wife, has many wonderful qualities, but the kind of discretion expected from a rector's wife is not one of them. In her defense, anyone who had eaten at our table could confirm how dreadful Sarah's cooking was. Once she put a pan of eggs on the stove and then completely forgot about them. The water boiled away and the eggs exploded, filling the house with a foul, sulfuric smell. I imagine this is how the gates of hell must smell, commented our neighbor Miss Harper with a mischievous glint in her eye when she came over for lunch. It took three layers of paint to repair the kitchen ceiling afterward, so we were not upset when Sarah told us she was leaving after learning that Clara was expecting. Sarah could not tolerate children, let alone babies. Mrs. Harper, who has a talent for training young women in household work, came to our aid. We hired Emily, who was everything Sarah was not. She is dependable, competent, and absolutely devoted to our son, Peter. She is a decent cook, but an even better baker. Claire often says Emily has a face as stern as a policeman's boot, which she believes will scare off any backdoor suitors, like Paul Fisher, who had been pursuing Sarah up until his death just last week. According to Mrs. Gates, the most outspoken of our town's spinsters, Paul had met his end through his own foolishness. Everyone knew he was a poacher, but secrets don't last long in a place like Ashbury, especially with Clara's so-called Old Hens Club, who spread news faster than the national broadcaster, although not always with the same level of accuracy. But I digress. Fisher had made a stew from one of Major Harding's pheasants, mixing it with some wild mushrooms. Although he was skilled at foraging, he somehow managed to include enough poisonous mushrooms to kill himself. A farm worker passing by was alerted by the distressed barking of Fisher's terrier. He looked through the window and saw Fisher lying on the floor, surrounded by shattered dishes and a broken beer bottle. Even though Fisher was notorious for taking what was not his, the local authorities did not brush his death off lightly. Inspector Crane, whose name could not be more misleading, arrived from Westbrook, full of his usual pomp. He spent most of the day ordering everyone around before sealing up the cottage. That won't do much good. Anyone could break into that rundown shack of Fisher's within minutes, commented my nephew Charlie, who, after a year as a trainee police officer, considers himself an expert on all things crime related. It appeared, though, that even Inspector Crane could not find any reason to suspect foul play. Earlier that day, Mrs. Harper stopped me as I passed her garden. Do you know when Fisher's funeral will be held? She asked. His family can't make any arrangements until the police release his body. Didn't you hear? The coroner ruled his death as natural causes. The seal on his cottage was removed yesterday, and I believe Sarah has already visited. It was her afternoon off. Of course, Mrs. Harper would note the schedule of every maid in the town, but not even she could have predicted that I would walk into my kitchen after our chat to find Sarah lying on the stone floor, her head in a pool of blood, with a cast iron skillet discarded beside her. Although I was afraid she was dead, I still crouched down and checked her wrist for a pulse. There was no movement, and her skin was cold. I stood up and headed to the phone in the hallway, much to the annoyance of Mrs. Firth, Miss Greer, and Miss Weston. And we don't have a local constable here in Ashbury, which Charlie says is probably for the best, as he's already their favorite target for complaints. So I had no choice but to call Westbrook, where Inspector Crane is in charge. I had hoped he might be out in another case, but as soon as I mentioned dead body, I was passed through a series of clicks and buzzing sounds to the inspector himself. Mr. Collins, he barked, what's this about a dead body in your kitchen? 
I explained what I had found. There was a long pause. Then Crane snapped. He'd think one murder at the rectory would be enough for any clergyman. He stopped again. I wasn't sure what he expected me to say, so I stayed quiet. Finally, he sighed. Don't touch anything. We'll be there soon. The loud clatter of the phone as the receiver was slammed down echoed unpleasantly in my ears. True to his word, Crane arrived with Charlie and another officer. I was quickly ushered out of the kitchen and into my study, where Crane joined me shortly after. Officer Harris mentioned that the dead woman used to work here, he said, getting straight to the point. Before I could respond, there was a knock at the garden doors. It was Mrs. Harper, holding her gardening gloves and a pair of pruning shears. Ignoring Crane's disapproving sighs, I opened the door. Without a lawyer present, I felt the need for some moral support. I couldn't help but notice the police arriving. Mrs. Harper remarked as she stepped inside, those police vans are never subtle. There's no need for subtlety when a woman has been bludgeoned to death, Crane replied curtly. Mrs. Harper looked surprised, but not with the shock you might expect from an older woman. And I already knew my neighbor was much tougher than she seemed, having witnessed her calm during the Harding murder, which took place in this very room. How upsetting, she said, but who? Who has been killed? I know it can't be Clara or Emily, since I saw them leaving earlier this morning. They took Peter to Riverford to visit Clara's parents. Officer Harris said the victim is Sarah Green. Crane interrupted in his usual abrupt tone. Now, Mrs. Harper did look genuinely shocked. Sarah, but what on earth was she doing here? That's exactly what I'm wondering, Crane said, turning to me. Did she have an appointment to see you? I shook my head. No, she didn't. She hadn't even been to church since she quit. She started working for Miss Greer. And the only times I've spoken to her since have been when she answered the door at Miss Greer's house. Was she friends with your maid, Emily? Not that I know of, I responded. Emily is much too practical to spend her time with someone like Sarah. Why Sarah was killed in your kitchen is a real mystery. Crane circled around the topic for a while without making any progress. He asked where I had been before making the discovery and I listed the parishioners I had visited. He dramatically wrote down their names and addresses, making me feel strangely guilty, even though I knew I had nothing to do with Sarah's death. Eventually, he left us alone. And I think I should pay a visit of condolence to Miss Greer, I said. Yes, Reverend, but she may not have heard about Sarah's death yet. It's Miss Harper stood up. If you do not mind, I would like to join you. It can be helpful to have another woman present when delivering tragic news. I've always found it impossible to refuse Miss Harper. She is never overbearing like Miss Greer, nor commanding like Mrs. Firth, nor guilt-inducing like Miss Weston. But when she wants something, she has a way of making it seem inevitable. I believe, Reverend, we should leave through the garden and take the back lane. That police car at your front door has likely stirred up curiosity all over town and will be forced to answer a lot of questions before we can get anywhere near Miss Greer's. As we neared Miss Greer's garden, I could see that, like Mrs. Harper, she was using the guise of trimming her roses to keep an eye on the rectory. The moment we got within shouting distance, she jumped up with a swiftness that she usually reserved for scaring the local children. Reverend, she called out loudly. I saw the police at your door. Was there a break in? Mrs. Harper placed her hand on the garden gate. May we come in, dear? I think we could all use a cup of tea. Miss Greer snorted. You might have to make it yourself, Jane. Sarah has wandered off again in one of her moods. I haven't seen her since she cleared the coffee cups after Sophie Manning dropped by. You know Sophie, Reverend, the romance novelist. I don't care much for that nonsense, but the younger girls seem to eat it up. I paused, suddenly unsure about delivering such grim news amidst the gladioli, dahlias, and talk of romance novels. I tend to forget 
just how tough my older parishioners can be beneath their modest exteriors. Sarah isn't sulking, dear. Sarah has been murdered, Mrs. Harper said, with no hint of theatrics in her voice. Miss Greer's jaw dropped, showing her large yellowing teeth, which would have looked more fitting on Major Harding's prized hunting horse. Sarah murdered. There must be some mistake, Jane. What reason could anyone possibly have to kill Sarah? It's not like she was smart enough to be a threat, or interesting enough to make anyone angry. And it seemed that the usual rule of not speaking ill of the dead did not apply when the deceased belonged to the servant class. Even so, Mrs. Harper carried on murdered she has been. Good heavens, Miss Greer muttered again. This calls for something stronger than tea. Perhaps a bit of sherry, anyone? Before I could decline, Miss Greer had hurried inside, with Mrs. Harper following close behind. She made a beeline for the decanter and glasses on the sideboard, but before she could pour, Mrs. Harper spoke up again. So would it be possible for us to take a quick look at Sarah's room? Miss Greer frowned. Isn't that the police's job? Yes, but Inspector Crane won't notice things the way we might. We may see something that would escape his attention. Mrs. Harper was at her most humble. If Clara had been there, I knew she would have struggled not to laugh. Clever Jane, you always notice the little things. Come, let's have a look. Miss Greer led us down the hall and through the kitchen to a small room that likely used to be a pantry. Between the single bed, small wardrobe, and a chest of drawers, there was hardly any space for both women, so I stayed near the doorway. So Mrs. Harper examined the room carefully, noting the poorly painted landscape and the small mirror. She opened the top drawer of the chest and pulled out a bundle of postcards. All but the top one were secured with a rubber band. She turned the bundle over. Even from where I stood, I could see the postmarked stamp and the poorly written handwriting. From Paul, she remarked, presumably Paul Fisher. Miss Greer stiffened defensively. I wouldn't let Sarah talk to him on the phone. He sent her postcards instead to arrange their meetings and share news. Did you read them? I asked. It was impossible not to, Miss Greer replied coolly. They were delivered to my house, after all. Mrs. Harper ignored the back and forth, her focus entirely on the loose card. Very interesting, she murmured as she put them back in the drawer. Finding nothing else of note in the chest, she moved to the wardrobe and methodically checked the pockets. Other than a few handkerchiefs, her search turned up nothing. Thank you, dear, Mrs. Harper said, making her way to the door, forcing Miss Greer and me to awkwardly step back. Now, about that sherry. We went back to the sitting room. I usually avoid alcohol before lunch, but with the way the day was unfolding, I gratefully accepted the glass. Who could have done such a thing? Miss Greer repeated over and over between sips. She didn't seem to expect an answer, but Mrs. Harper asked if there were any other men who had been interested in Sarah. Our hostess snorted with disdain. Not at all, Jane. I never understood what Paul Fisher saw in her. Paul wasn't exactly a prize, I ventured. Mrs. Harper gave me a fond smile. You're rather naive, Reverend. Before I could respond, the doorbell rang. Miss Greer groaned and stood up. Now I'll have to find a new maid, she grumbled. She came back with Inspector Crane following close behind. Reverend, what are you doing here? I'm here to inform Miss Greer of Sarah's tragic death, I replied. He turned a disapproving glare toward Mrs. Harper. And you, Mrs. Harper, I hope you're not mangling in police matters again. I'm here to offer my sympathies, Mrs. Harper said curtly. She finished her sherry and stood. Now, I'll take my leave. I was torn between wanting to see if Crane had made any headway and my curiosity about what had come to Harper's attention with the postcard in Sensera's drawer. And I could always ask her later, but getting information from Crane was a different matter. So I followed him and Miss Greer to Sarah's room. I glanced back at Miss Harper, who was staring off into the distance toward the bay window that overlooked the street. At the doorway to Sarah's room, Crane quickly dismissed us. There's no need for either of you to meddle with the crime scene. Don't you have parishioners to visit, Reverend? 
or did you manage to fit them all in this morning? I caught up with Mrs. Harper outside, where she had stopped to admire the late bloomers in Miss Greer's garden. Once we were far enough from the house, I asked her what had caught her interest in Sarah's room. She smiled kindly. Reverend, you don't miss much. What stood out to me was that the stamp on the postcard hadn't been postmarked. Do you mean it wasn't sent through the mail? That's right. My guess is that Fisher wrote it, but never got the chance to send it before he died, and that Sarah found it when she visited his cottage yesterday afternoon. And what did it say? Mrs. Harper closed her eyes as if recalling it from memory. Big surprise in the woods today, for we might be able to profit from it. She opened her eyes and smiled. That's all. No hint about what he meant. We can speculate. I can think of at least three or four different explanations, can't you? We were nearly at Mrs. Harper's gate when a thought struck me. But if that's all the postcard said, why would anyone feel threatened enough to kill Sarah? That's the big question, isn't it? With that, she turned into her garden and left me no closer to an answer. But Clara came home just before six, with the tired and cranky Peter in tow. I tousled his hair as Emily whisked him off for his bath and bedtime routine. That's difficult to believe. Clara remarked, given the usual network of watchers around here. It must have been during that moment in the morning when they're all busy making sure their maids polish the light bulbs, Charlie added. But the real point, I said, is that it's hard to imagine anyone who would have had a reason to kill Sarah. Except maybe Miss Greer, Clara said, but if she wanted to avoid Sarah's terrible roasts, she could have just fired her. So this isn't something to joke about, I scolded. Sarah was violently murdered in the very kitchen she used to call her own. Clara looked a little ashamed. I'm sorry, Alan. It's just how I handle things. Before I could respond, Emily entered the room with Mrs. Harper. She hesitated briefly at the doorway, then came inside. My dear Clara, how awful for you. For even worse for Sarah, Clara replied and for poor Emily, who's down on her knees scrubbing the blood from the kitchen floor. Of course, and quite unsettling for you, Charlie. Your first murder case, she paused, frowning. At least I assume it's your first. Charlie sat up a little straighter. It really emphasizes how important our work is. Indeed, Mrs. Harper agreed, then turned to Clara with an apologetic smile. I'm sorry to interrupt at a time like this, but were you still planning to go into Westbrook tomorrow? I had hoped to visit the chemist. Oh, absolutely. I don't think Sarah would have wanted us to go into mourning. With her task accomplished, Mrs. Harper stood up, and I escorted her out. I was conflicted, unsure whether to wait and see if Crane had made any progress, or to try to find out what had caught Mrs. Harper's interest about the loose postcard in Sarah's drawer. I could always ask Mrs. Harper later, but Crane was not as easy to approach. So I followed him and Miss Greer to Sarah's room. They glanced back at Mrs. Harper, who seemed to be staring into the distance towards the window that looked out onto the street. At the doorway to Sarah's room, Crane quickly dismissed us. There's no need for either of you to interfere with the crime scene. I don't you have parishioners to attend to, Reverend, or did you get to them all this morning? I caught up with Mrs. Harper as we walked towards the gate, where she had stopped to admire the late flowers in the garden. Once we were far enough from Miss Greer's house, I asked her what had piqued her interest in Sarah's room. She smiled warmly. Reverend, not much escapes you. What stood out to me was that the stamp on the postcard hadn't been postmarked. You mean it hadn't been mailed? It seems that way. My guess is that Fisher wrote it but never got the chance to send it before he died. And Sarah must have found it yesterday when she visited his cottage for the first time since his death. What did it say? Mrs. Harper closed her eyes as though recalling the message. Big surprise in the woods today. We might be able to profit from it. She blinked and smiled. That's all there was. No hint of what he meant. We can only guess. I can think of at least three or four explanations, can't you? We were nearly at Mrs. Harper's gate when a thought struck me. 
But if that's all the card said, why would anyone feel so threatened by it that they'd kill Sarah? That's the real question, isn't it? With that, she turned into her garden, leaving me no closer to an answer. Clara came home just before six, with an exhausted and irritable Peter in tow. I ruffled his hair as Emily whisked him off for his bath and bedtime. The Lacrara sighed deeply as she collapsed into the armchair. My parents are getting duller and more close-minded with age, she complained. I always feel uneasy when Claire makes these remarks, as she seems to forget that I am much closer to her parents' age than hers. The thought that she might come to view me the same way someday is always at the back of my mind. She must have sensed my unease because she leaned over and kissed my cheek. Don't be ridiculous, Alan. My life's mission is to keep you young forever, she teased. Then she yawned. I'm exhausted. My father gets Peter all excited with his toy soldiers. My mother stuffs him full of sweets and lemonade until he's completely out of control. When he reaches that point, they suddenly have urgent business to attend to, and I'm left to deal with the aftermath. As she stood and made her way to the door, I asked, where are you going? My tone must have been sharper than I intended. She turned surprised and said, to the kitchen to heat up the pie Emily made for dinner. Why? Panic rushed through me. You can't. Don't go into the kitchen. She stared at me as though I had lost my mind. Why on earth not? How are we supposed to have dinner if I can't go into the kitchen? Before I could answer, we heard a scream from Emily. Clara and I rushed to the kitchen to find Emily standing there, her apron held to her face, sobbing. The blood, the blood. Clara looked down and saw the dark, congealed pool of blood where Sarah had been found earlier. She looked at me in shock. What's going on, Alan? Why is there blood all over the floor? It took some time to explain what had happened earlier that day. Emily, shaken by the sight of the blood, threatened to quit on the spot, and Clara and I had to calm her down and convince her to stay. To meanwhile, Peter was nearly hysterical over the disruption to his routine and the delay of his evening milk and biscuits. Clara, however, was less disturbed by the events than intrigued. When Charlie arrived home from the station after his shift, Clara eagerly asked, Have you made any arrests yet? Charlie sank into an armchair and shook his head. Not yet. We haven't found a single clue or witness to say who might have killed Sarah or how they managed to enter and leave the house without anyone noticing. It's hard to believe, Clara remarked. In a village like this, someone must have seen something. It must have happened during that brief window when everyone is busy making sure their maids are polishing the silverware, Charlie added with a shrug. More importantly, I said, it's difficult to see who would have had any reason to murder Sarah. Maybe Miss Greer, Clara suggested with a grin. If she wanted to avoid Sarah's terrible cooking, she could have just dismissed her. I frowned. This is no time for jokes, Clara. Sarah was brutally murdered in the kitchen she once called her own. Clara apologized softly. I'm sorry, Alan. I use humor to cope with things like this. Before I could respond, Emily appeared in the doorway to announce that Mrs. Harper had arrived. Clara and I exchanged looks before I sighed and said, Show her in, Emily. Miss Harper entered, her face a picture of concern. She immediately addressed Clara. How awful this must be for you, my dear. It's worse for Sarah, Clara replied, and for poor Emily, who's on her hands and knees trying to clean the blood from the kitchen floor. Mrs. Harper turned her attention to Charlie. And how difficult this must be for you, Charlie. Is this your first murder case? Charlie sat up straight. Yes, it really makes you realize how important our work is. Indeed, Mrs. Harper agreed. She turned back to Clara with a gentle smile. I hate to impose, but I was wondering if you were still planning to go into Westbrook tomorrow. I was hoping to visit the chemist. Clara nodded, yes, of course. I don't think Sarah would have expected us to go into formal mourning. Satisfied, Mrs. Harper stood, and I walked her to the door. I was torn between staying to see if Charlie had any updates and trying to find out what had piqued Mrs. Harper's interest earlier.
but Charlie could always be questioned later, so I followed him and Miss Greer to Sarah's room. Once at the room's entrance, Crane quickly dismissed us, saying, There's no need for you two to interfere. Don't you have parishioners to attend to, Reverend, or have you managed to visit them all already? I caught up with Mrs. Harper, who had paused at the gate to admire the flowers. Once we were away from Miss Greer's house, I asked what had interested her in Sarah's room. So Mrs. Harper smiled warmly and said, What caught my eye was that the stamp on the postcard wasn't postmarked. You mean it hadn't been mailed? I asked. Exactly. I suspect Fisher wrote it but never had the chance to send it. Sarah must have found it when she visited his cottage after his death. What did it say? Mrs. Harper closed her eyes for a moment, as if visualizing the card. It said, Big surprise in the woods today. We might be able to make a profit from it. She opened her eyes and smiled. And that's all it said. No clue as to what it meant, I asked. Not exactly. We can only speculate. I can think of at least three or four possible explanations. We had almost reached Mrs. Harper's gate when it occurred to me. But if that's all the card said, why would someone feel so threatened by it that they'd kill Sarah? Mrs. Harper smiled knowingly. That is indeed the question, isn't it? With that, she turned and entered her garden, leaving me none the wiser. Clara returned home shortly before six, accompanied by a tired and cranky Peter. I ruffled Peter's hair as Emily took him off for his bath and bedtime routine. 